Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the Epistle to the Romans in our continuing survey of the New Testament. I want to suggest to you that the epistles are to the Gospels what the prophets are to the Torah. You know, you have Moses giving the law, that's the Torah, and then after that, at a later date, the prophets come along and they explain the Torah, apply it. Yes, they give prophecy of the future, but they also tell what God is doing in the present on the basis of the law that had been given back in the Torah. Likewise, the Gospels tell the story of Jesus, but when we get to the epistles, they act as a commentary on what we do with the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, how that impacts our life today. The Pauline epistles, and that's what we're going to look at first, this whole section of epistles that were written by the Apostle Paul, we can start off grouping them, um, and they are given not in chronological order in which they're written, but rather a topical order. Uh, the first ones we could call foundational. Uh, so we have the Gospel to the Romans, uh, First and Second Corinthians, and Galatians. These are foundational epistles. Next we have what we call the prison epistles. Now these were all written at a particular time, a time when Paul is in prison, uh, closer to the end of his life, and they include Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I suppose we could put Philemon in there uh, be, if we were just talking chronological because it's written about the same time, but we're going to group it a bit separately. Uh, next we have what I'm going to call the prophetic epistles. Um, they're not exclusively about prophecy. In fact, there's quite a bit about ethics. Uh, but they contain more prophecy in Paul's writing than all of the other epistles put together. And that's First and Second Thessalonians. Finally, we have the pastoral epistles. Uh, and these are uh, epistles that were, were written to individuals, First and Second Timothy and Titus. And, and we, I said, you know, if we were approaching Philemon chronologically, we might put it with the prison epistles. But I'm, uh, it's here in, in, among the pastoral epistles, and that is how it appears in our New Testament. Because it is pastoral, uh, that is First and Second Timothy and Titus, those are written to church leaders. This one is written to not necessarily a church leader, but it's still written for uh, a pastoral purpose. Now we come to the Gospel of Romans, and the big idea in the book of Romans is the righteousness of God. This overview, I think, might be helpful. Chapters 1 through 8, and, and the entire book, remember, uh, shows about how the righteousness of God has been revealed. In chapters 1 through 8, we see, first of all, in the first three chapters, it's the righteousness of God has been revealed in judging sinners. And we're going to see that in the first three chapters. And then in bringing salvation to sinners, and that is introduced in the latter part of chapter 3, and then continues chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And in chapter 9... Um, Paul asks the question, wait a minute, what about Israel? And so the righteousness of God has been revealed in God's dealings with Israel. And finally, in chapters 12 through 16, the righteousness of God has been revealed in the lives of those who follow him. We could describe the first 11 chapters as doctrinal in nature. The last chapters 12 through 16 are more practical. They give the so what. Here's how you live on the basis of all that we've taught you. But notice we have that phrase in chapter 1, verse 5, the obedience of faith. And when we come to chapter 16, verse 20, again we see that phrase, the obedience of faith. So we go from, from faith to faith throughout this entire epistle um, as we look at this major theme of the righteousness of God and the way in, it has, in which it has been revealed. Paul starts off after his introduction in chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Um, in it, that is, in the gospel, the righteousness, and here's, here's introducing our main theme. We said the righteousness of God is our main theme. In that gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, that brings up a question. How is the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel? Well, we see that in chapters 1 through 3, where the wrath of God toward those who sin is seen, that God is righteous. God is righteous because when somebody does acts of unrighteousness, God's anger is displayed. His wrath is revealed. But when we get to chapters 4 through 8, the good news is that the grace of God toward those who believe is seen 
and depicts and upholds that same righteousness of God. So the righteousness of God results in condemnation of the sinner. And you say, wait a minute, we've all sinned. This, that, that would result in the condemnation of all of us. But the good news is the righteousness of God has also brought about, as it matches and meets the love of God and the grace of God, it results in that righteousness being fulfilled in Jesus on our behalf. Now, the righteousness of God is revealed then. That's what we're seeing in chapter 1. Uh, in judging the pagans who rejected him. And Paul takes us on a very dark journey to look and see exactly uh, what was believed by those who rejected the God of the universe. And God gave them over to their own way of living. His righteousness is revealed when we get to Romans chapter 2 in judging the Jews who disobeyed him. So notice Paul begins with pagans, those who turned away from God. He comes to the Jews in chapter 2, the people who, who should have known better, who knew about God, who had the scriptures, and yet they disobeyed as well. And God's judgment comes upon them just as it comes against the pagans. And then he sums it all up when we get to chapter 3. God, the righteousness of God is revealed in judging all men, whether it's Jew or Gentile, whether it's pagan or um, those who know about God and even believe in him. God's righteousness is, is revealed in judging all who have sinned against him. And that, that's all of us. In fact, chapter 3, verse 23 says, For we all have sinned and fall short. You know, notice the difference in tenses. We all have sinned in the past and we fall short in the present. We fall short of the glory of God. Here's that verse again. For all have sinned. The Greek word there, uh, hamarton, uh, is the idea of, you know, to, to sin, to fall away. Uh, comes from, it's the aorist active indicative of hamartano. Uh, literally, to miss the mark. It's actually translated that way uh, once in the Septuagint of the Old Testament. Uh, and by aorist tense, it's looking to the past tense. All have sinned, but notice, and they fall short of the glory of God. Let's read the rest of uh, the next two verses. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, <coughs> whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood, faith. So all have sinned, but notice being justified. Now to justify something, it just means to declare that it is just, to declare that it is righteous. It doesn't make it righteous, it doesn't make it just, but it declares it to be. It recognizes the justice of something. When I, when I justify my actions, I'm, I'm trying to explain and say why they are why they are just, why they are right. We have been declared righteous. We have been justified. Notice, not on the basis of what we did, because what we did was we sinned. We fell short of the glory of God. But we have been justified as a gift by His grace. Which brings us, that brings us to the next important word. His grace. The word grace speaks the, uh, the Greek word uh, kariti, uh, from the uh, root word charis. Um, it speaks of a gift that is given. Now, the word grace is very close to the word for mercy. Now, I mean, they don't sound alike, either in English or in Greek, but the ideas there are very close. Mercy is not getting the punishment that you deserve. You deserve, you know, something bad, and the judge shows mercy, and you don't get that, that punishment. Grace is the flip side of that. Grace is getting the good thing you do not deserve. Now, let me say that again. Mercy is not getting the bad thing you do deserve. Grace is getting the good thing that you do deserve. It's like if you're pulled over by a police officer because you've been going over the speed limit. Mercy is when he does not give you a ticket. Grace is when he gives you a box of donuts. That's a wonderful thing. Excuse the illustration. Uh, justified by, uh, by his... We've been justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption. Let's take that next word, through the redemption. The uh, genitive singular of apolutrosis. Um, actually a compound word. The apo part means uh, from, like, like uh, 
well, I'm not going to get into, into other roots that have that. And then lutrosis is to set free. So we've been set free from. Um, and that's what redemption is. It's a term that speaks to slavery. When a slave was set free, you could say he's redeemed. When the people of Israel had been slaves in Egypt and they were brought out of Egypt, the Old Testament says they were redeemed. They were set free. They were liberated. That's a good word for it. And we have, you know, by God's grace, we have been liberated through the liberation which comes, which is in Christ Jesus. Whom God displayed publicly, here's our last term that we're going to look at, he, God displayed publicly as a propitiation. Now, we don't usually use the word propitiation today. Uh, the Greek word there, hilasterios. Uh, actually, it's interesting because that term, that Greek term, is used in a couple places in the New Testament to describe the the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, that place that symbolized the throne of God, and the um, the high priest would come in once a year and sprinkle blood upon the lid of the Ark, and it's been translated in our English Bibles, the mercy seat, but the word that's translated mercy seat is actually from this Greek word here, the propitiation, or let me give you a, a, a synonym for that word, the satisfaction. It's the place where God's anger is satisfied. And the place where God's anger was satisfied was Jesus on the cross. In his blood through faith. When we trust in him, we find that we have reached a place of where God's anger against us was satisfied. Notice the progress here. We sinned. And that was met by God's grace, which results in propitiation, his satisfaction with what Christ did on our behalf. And as a result of God's satisfaction, we are redeemed, that is, we are liberated, we are set free from our sin and from the penalty of that sin. And we have been now declared not just free, but we have not been declared just um, not just forgiven, but we have been declared righteous. We have been justified. We've been declared righteous. Now that brings up a question. How can God declare me to be righteous when, frankly, I'm not righteous? How is a person justified? And that is answered in chapter 4 of Romans. Romans chapter 4, verse 1, what, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So, uh, you know, wh how was Abraham uh, justified? Was he justified by works? No, he would have something to boast about, but that's just not the case. We go on to see in the next verse. For what does the scripture say, and, and Paul quotes Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, Abraham believed God, and it was, here's another word that we're going to have to look at a bit, credited to him. And I love the way the New American Standard is translated. Credited to him, I guess they could have said reckoned, it would mean the same thing. The heiress passive indicative of logizomai. Uh, notice it's a passive voice, which means that uh, Abraham didn't do it. it. It happened to him. It's an heiress point tense. That's just looking at the time back in Abraham's life when, when this took place. It wasn't a continuing thing. It looks at it as sort of as a, an action in the past. Uh, Abraham believed God, and it was credited or reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, Paul goes on to say, his wage is not credited as a favor. Notice the repetition of that word, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited, same term there, this time it's present passive. Uh, in other words, it's still passive voice, but now we're talking now about what's happening, happened in Abraham's life in the past, but what happens to us uh, now. The one who believes in in him, that is God, who justifies the ungodly, who declares righteous the uh, unrighteous, who declares godly the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. You see, what takes place is what we call imputation, where on the cross, when Jesus was on the cross, our sinfulness was reckoned or credited to him. 
God treated Jesus on the cross as though he were a sinner. He's not a, he wasn't a sinner. He never sinned. But our sins were credited or reckoned to him. And likewise, when we believe, Christ's righteousness is credited or reckoned to us. So imputation involves a twofold reckoning, our sinfulness reckoned to Jesus and his righteousness reckoned to us when we believe. So that the righteousness of God, remember that's the big idea in Romans, the righteousness of God is revealed in reckoning men as righteous by crediting them with the righteousness of Christ. That's chapter 4. That's what chapter 4 is all about. When we get to chapter 5, the righteousness of God is revealed in declaring men to be righteous on the basis of the reckoning described in the previous chapter. So we're going to see how Paul takes that and puts it all together. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, now we're talking, looking back at Genesis and, and Adam, uh, Adam sinned, and, and by Adam's sin, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all, uh, all sin, notice how he, he starts off with a just as, now he's going to get to an even so, but first he interrupts himself. You see, because of sin, death came into the world, and now Paul has to explain that. For until the law, sin was in the world. But, here's the problem, sin is not imputed where there is no law. Sin is, is not reckoned where there is no law. If you live in a place where there is no speed limit, then the traffic police cannot give you a ticket for going over a certain speed limit because there is no law for it. Sin is not reckoned when there hasn't been a law against doing that thing. However, verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Let's look at it this way. If death comes through sin, and it does, and if sin is not reckoned without law, and sin isn't reckoned unless there's been a law, and if the law did not come until Moses, then that brings up a question, then why did people die between Adam and Moses? And the answer that Paul gives, they didn't have the Mosaic law yet, the answer that Paul gives is because Adam's sin was reckoned to all of his descendants. In fact, it's reckoned to us as well. You say, wait a minute, I wasn't there. Well, no, but your representative your great, 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 and a bunch more great granddaddy represented the entire human race. And when he sinned, it is as though you sinned too. That's the bad news. Adam's sin was imputed to all men. It was reckoned, that this word, the word imputed means, it was reckoned, it was credited to all men. That's the bad news. But now we come to the good news. So then, as through one transgression there res resulted in condemnation to all men, that was the bad news. E he has restated it, notice. Verse, um, the rest of the verse. Even so, through one act of righteousness, that is, Jesus going to the cross, through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. So, in the same way that, that Adam's sin was credited to me, so likewise the righteousness of Christ has been credited to me when I believe. So the righteousness of God is revealed in reckoning men as righteous by crediting them with the righteousness of Christ. We saw that in chapter 4. It is revealed in declaring men to be righteous on the basis of the reckoning described in the previous chapter. That's what we just saw now in chapter 5. But that brings up the question, what about sin? If salvation is just a matter of righteousness being credited, does that mean I can go live as I please? Does that mean I can go sin a lot? And can in Paul asked the question in chapter 6, can we continue to live in sin? And he replies, absolutely not. No way. What about, though, 
the sin that is still in our lives as Christians. You know, you, you ever notice you, you came to Christ and and you didn't suddenly stop, you know, once and for all forever sinning. None of us have. In fact, later on uh, in in First John, we're going to to read that if somebody says he has no sin, he deceives himself, and the truth isn't in him. And the truth of the matter, Paul describes his own crisis of faith and walk of faith about how there were things that he wanted to do that he didn't do and things that he didn't want to do that he did. What about the sin that is still in our lives? And he points out there is still that presence. But the good news is that the Lord has adopted us as his children. So he's declared us to be righteous. He has put the spirit within us. And that spirit is a spirit of adoption where we become his children through that process of adoption. God cho you know, when you when you have a baby, that's nice, but when you adopt a baby, that's something you're determining and choosing. You're saying, I'm going to choose and God chose us. And he adopted us as his children. Now, that brings up us to the question that's approached in chapter 9. Paul has taken us on this tour of, of faith and how we come to Christ in faith, but then he asks the question, now what about Israel that, at least I mean, regarding the entire nation, they have not believed? Now, Paul's not saying nobody in Israel believed. He was an Israelite himself, and the early church was made up of, uh, pretty much exclusively of, his, of Israelites. They actually had to have a, a church council to figure out whether to let the Gentiles into the church. They weren't sure if they ought to do it. You know, Gentiles for Jesus just doesn't sound too good. Uh, but, but they did. Sometimes I wonder if they've been regretting it ever since. But now Paul asked the question, what about Israel? How can we see God as righteous? Here's the question. How can we see God as righteous when his own chosen people do not believe and receive his promises? And so he points out several factors that help us to understand this. First of all, not, I not all Israel is Israel. That it's possible to be an Israelite externally, that is physically, a descendant of Jacob, and not really be a spiritual descendant of Jacob. Not be a true Israelite. Paul's already alluded to the same thing uh, earlier, back in chapter 2, he said... Uh, uh, you know, not all Jews are, are Jews. You, you have Jews after the flesh. You have Jews who are Jews spiritually, inwardly. Um, and likewise, not all Israel is Israel. And then the latter part of chapter 9, he says, you know, God is sovereign and able to choose whom he wills. Remember how Israel is called the chosen people. And God has the right to choose Israel and not to choose somebody else. And God is sovereign and, and he does what he wants and he does it right well. And he's able to choose whom he wills. And salvation is offered. This is now into chapter 10. Salvation is offered to all who believe. And Israel has the right to believe, but also non-Israel. You know, those who physically are not, are, you know, Jewish. They have the right to believe. So that the, the gospel has gone not just to Jews. It started with the Jews, but it has gone from there to the Gentiles. And it is offered to all who will believe. And Israel's unbelief, this is chapter 11 now, Israel's unbelief has resulted in blessings to the Gentiles. And Paul says, if Israel's unbelief resulted in blessings to the Gentiles, imagine what would be re the result if Israel believed. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And I think he leaves us with hope that that will be indeed the case. In fact, he, he says at the end of the story, all Israel, and I, I take that to mean both, you know, both uh, those who are, you know, sort of came over to Israel, you know, in other words, spiritual Israel, and uh, spiritual Israel who were Gentile, spiritual Israel who were Jews, all Israel will be saved. And what a glory that will be. Now, we get to chapter 12, like we said, chapters 1 through 11, that's the doctrinal section. Chapters 12 through 16 now are the practical section. Section They give the big so what. In chapters uh, 1 through 11, we've had all the things that we are to believe. 
chapters 12 through 16, all the things that we are to do as a result of having believed. So he starts off here in chapter 12, verse 1, I urge you to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he begins to lay out what that looks like in the life of the Christian. So that chapter 12 sets forth our personal responsibility. Boom, my tongue got tangled around my eye teeth. I couldn't see what I was saying. In chapter 13, um, we, we move over to the responsibility of the believer as, his, as he interacts with government. And remember, government back then wasn't an elected government. Government was the Roman Empire. It was a very harsh government, at least the way we would look at it. And yet, there's some instructions given. Uh, in chapter 12, Paul says, offer your bodies as a holy and living sacrifice. In chapter 13, he's going to say, be in subjection to the governing authorities. In chapter 12, he says, uh, never pay back evil for evil, and vengeance is mine. I will repay. He's actually quoting from the Old Testament, says the Lord. Uh, in chapter 13, we find out that government does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. So sometimes the way that, that God brings about his veg vengeance uh, and repaying evil is by using government to do that. In chapter 12, he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In chapter 13, he says, rulers are not a cause of fear uh, for good behavior, but for evil. So, you know, th there's, a, there's something that God has set in place for the punishment of the evildoer, and that's called government. That's actually the job of government to do that. Now we get to chapters 14. Uh, in chapters 14, the first part, um, verses 1 through 12, God, uh, Paul says, do not judge one another. And then his theme changes in chapters 14, verses 13 through 23, do not offend one, not, not one another. So he speaks against judging, but then he speaks against causing offense, which might cause somebody else to judge you. Finally, we come to the closing chapters. Now I want to... I'm actually going to put these in parallel. I'm going to go back to chapter 1 and now look at the closing chapter beginning in chapter 15. Um, in chapter, back in chapter 1, verse 13, uh, and we, we sort of skipped over that. We just said how Paul gave a, sh a brief introduction. Uh, but in that introduction, Paul had said, I often plan to come to you, to you Romans. Paul had never been to Rome. He's actually writing this epistle to a church to which he's never been. And he said, I often planned to come to you, but was hindered. And now he's repeating that in chapter 15, verse 22. I've often been hindered from coming to you. Uh, in chapter 1, he had said, and notice, uh, actually a little bit earlier, uh, he had said, I long to see you that I may be encouraged with you. Now in chapter 15, verse 24, and, and we're doing putting it in the right order, I'm trying to parallel these things. I hope to see you in passing and be helped on my way. Uh, back in chapter 1, verse 8, he had said, Your faith is proclaimed throughout the whole world. He's repeating that now in chapter 16, verse 19. Uh, the report of your obedience has reached all. In chapter 1, verse 5, he had said, uh, I'm, I'm here, my mission, my mission is to bring about the obedience of faith to all the Gentiles. In chapter 16, verse 26, and we noted this already, that he uh, talks about how... He, the gospel has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. So that in chapter 16 now, and we're at the very last chapter, uh, Phoebe is commended. Now this is a, a woman who had been serving the church. Uh, in fact, the, the, way she, the way she's described, she is a servant. Uh, the way you say that in, in the Greek, you say she is a deaconess. And it's you know scholars have argued whether that's the she actually held a position of women deacon or if that's just more of a general term she was a, you know she served the church uh, maybe not in an official capacity uh, like the term would you know might suggest but just commended and I'm not sure which it is uh, but uh, she is commended you know she was a worker and had been helpful in the church and and Paul says uh, you extend her a greeting. Uh, he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, uh, who is a servant of the church which is at Centria, that's uh, going to be in Greece, near Corinth, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever manner 
matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. Uh, as I said, she, you know, she's serving as a servant in the church. In the church, which is at Centria. Now, uh, if we look at a map of Greece, um, I'm going to blow that up really quick. Don't want to spend a lot of time here. Uh, but just blow that up and you can see where Corinth is, but you can also see where Centria is. There's a picture of Corinth, and here's a picture of Centria right on the coast. Uh, there's not much left of it these days, a little, little bit of uh, um, you know, some dock places. And it was it was served as a port for Corinth. Uh, Corinth was like a, about half a mile inland, whereas Centria was, was right on the, on the, on the coast. And so Paul says, I want you to, I want you to, I commend her to you. I want you to receive her in the Lord in a matter, in a manner worthy of the saints. I want you to help her in whatever matter she might have need for. Next he says, uh, he gives just miscellaneous greetings to a number of different people. We, he mentions uh, all sorts of different names, chapters 3 through 16. Then we get to chapter 16, verses 17 through 20, and he gives a warning against dissensions. There were some squabbles going on in the church. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, remember what well, we talked about freedom before? But such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, but of their own appetites, and by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. And so you watch out for that sort of thing. For the report of your obedience has reached to all, we noted this already, therefore I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Sort of that, that, that benediction, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, reminds me a bit of that promise way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, a promise given, uh, spoken on in the instance where, where man and woman had sinned and God comes and puts a curse on the serpent. Um, but notice it's not the serpent that is mentioned here, it is Satan. Uh, I believe the power behind the serpent uh, and the promises that Satan is going to be crushed under your feet. You can sort of imagine a, a man stomping on the head of Satan, and that is a promise that's given here as well. Well, we had the warnings against dissension, and now we have more greetings. Notice how we had miscellaneous greetings in verses 3 through 16. There are uh, greetings, there's a, a benediction of grace. Finally, we have the closing benediction, verses 25 through 27. Let's look at that. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen.